All right, uh, welcome to Rampart Christian Fellowship. Today is November 8th, 20, 2015, and we are in part 11 of our series, um, of the sermon series titled, The Attributes of God. Um, and so far we've gone through, uh, let's, let's see what we've gone through so far. We've gone through God as creator. Uh, we've gone through God as a God of wrath. We've gone through the sovereignty of God, the grace of God, the glory of God, the omniscience, which God is all-knowing, the omnipresence, which means God is everywhere, the omnipotence, which means God is all-powerful, the trinity, which means that God is three distinct persons in one uh, divine creator. And last week we did the holiness of God. That means that God is different than everything else. And so this week we come to the immutability of God. That means that God is immutability means unchangeable unchanging and so god is is the same forever he is not he, he is not evolving he's not learning he's not growing god is god and he's always been god and so that's that's what we mean when we say the immutability of god we mean we mean the unchanging nature of god and in fact all of those attributes that we've gone through so far they are all immutable. God's glory is never changing. God's grace is never changing. God's, God's eternally sovereign. He's eter eternally all-knowing. He's eternally holy. And so when we think of the immutability of God, we, we must come to the, to the realization that God does not change. And so let me just uh, recap what this series is about. The, uh, the attributes of God is uh, I, I just wanted to go through this at, at, at this church so we could understand, get a gr greater understanding of God. I believe that the bigger God gets, the smaller the problems of this world become. And I believe to know God is to know the truth. And you know, Jesus said, it, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So the more we understand about God, the better equipped we will be to serve God. And in this series of messages, we will explore in depth the attributes of God so that we might gain a better understanding of our purpose in God. And, if, and also, if you want to get more information, there's, there's quite a few books. Um, Arthur Pink wrote the book, uh, The Attributes of God, as well. And uh, at Legionnaire.org, the uh, Dr. Stephen Lawson also does a series of messages called The Attributes of God. So there's, there's plenty more information if you really want to learn more about God. And I think it's one of the best things you could ever decide to study because there's two people you'll never get away from, yourself and God. <laughs> He's always there. So, the immutability of God. The subtitle is, God is God and He does not change. The immutable, unchanging, eternal nature of God is one of the most amazing attrib attributes of our great God. Unlike mankind who is always changing, God never changes. He is always the same. All of his attributes are eternal and all of his promises will come to pass. So let us meditate on, the, on this powerful truth and let us look into God's word to gain a greater understanding of the immutability of God. Amen? Let's go ahead and pray first. Father God, I pray that you would just open up our hearts and open up our minds and just lead us through your word so that we might truly understand who you are and how it is that you never change. So we thank you, we praise you, we just give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's get into the Bible. Um, we're going to start in the book of Exodus. We're going to kind of work our way from the beginning to the end. In the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verse 14, let's see what it says about the immutability of God. Exodus, chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Now this is where Moses goes up the mountain and he sees God in the burning bush. And the, bur the bush is burning, but it's not being consumed. And so God, or, or Moses is talking to God, and, and God is talking to Moses out of the burning bush. And he tells Moses, you got to go do this thing. you got to go lead, lead my people out of Egypt. And, and Moses starts making all kinds of excuses. He's like, I don't know if I can do this, you know, and... and and finally, he comes to the point, he says, okay, I'll go do it. But who am I going to tell them sent me? Who should I say? How, what, what, what will I call you, God? And so in, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, God says to Moses, I am who I am. 
He, uh, and he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So, so God is, is known as the great I am. And, and in, in, next, in a couple of weeks, we're going to go through the names of God. And that, that, and that name, I am, is one of the... And that's interesting when God says, when, when God um, declares who he is, he just says, I am. He doesn't say, I might be, or I could be, or I, I will be. He says, I am. He's eternally, I am. He's eternally in the present. So, so it speaks to the immut immutability of God, the unchanging nature of God. God just is. He is the great I am, and he, he never changes. So let's, let's, let's keep going, though. Uh, let's go to the book of Numbers, chapter 23, verse 19. And these, and these are all supporting uh, verses that support the idea of God being eternal, be God be never changing. So in, in the book of Numbers, chapter 23, let's, let's look what it says about God's immutability. Numbers chapter, 20, uh, chapter 23, verse 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Or in that word repent means to change, means to change his mind. Uh, um, he has, uh, has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and, he, and, and will he not make it good? See, that, that's the thing with God. He never changes. And when he says something will come to pass, it will come to pass. It's just, you can take it to the bank. It's going to happen. <laughs> and so when we, when we think about God never changing, I mean, there, there's a, you don't get a lot of guarantees in this world. I mean, the only th <laughs> you guaranteed... Uh, to um, death and taxes, right? This is one of the things they say. <laughs> but I tell you this much, when God gives you a promise, it's, it's, it's more, more um, foundational than death or taxes. When God promises something, it will come to pass. And so he's not a man that he should lie. He's not, and, and he, nor is he the son of man that he should repent or change. God is God. He, is, he is always has, he always will be, and he, uh, and he, he always just is. Amen. Let's go to the, the, the next, uh, well, it's a couple books down. It's called 2 Samuel. Now, Samuel was the prophet of God that was sent to bring the, the, the first two kings of Israel. Uh, king Saul, which was, which was uh, the, the people had chosen, or the, he was chosen by God, and the, the, but he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And then King David, which we all know the story of David and Goliath. Well, Samuel was sent to King, uh, king David, but uh, Samuel was this prophet of God, and he, and he was righteous. He, he, he always did what God wanted him to do. I mean, he was dedicated to the Lord from the time of his birth. And if we look in, in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 22, verse 2, this is what the Lord um, spoke to Samuel, saying. So 2 Samuel, chapter 22, verse 2, reads, it says, uh, then David spoke to the Lord, that's verse 1, uh, and words uh, of, this, of this song. On the day when the Lord had delivered him up from, from all of his enemies and from the land of Saul. And it says, it says, then he said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the, the God of my strength in whom I will trust. So David, he's that second, second king of Israel. And, and this is a common... Uh, a way that people describe God, that God is a rock. Now we think of, 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 of a giant, like a mountain that does not move. You know, you know, cities will come and go, nations will rise and fall, but the mountains will stand and they, and they will be there. And so that, that's what, how David sees God. He says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. And he trusts in God because he's always there. He doesn't, get, he doesn't get washed away. And even the, the description of God as a rock is faulty because we know that rocks on uh, on earth they they can erode by the water and they can be cracked by the ice but god is this unbreakable rock he's he is always there and so it's just it's a, just an analogy of, of who god is but it but it, it's just an example of how solid and how steadfast and how immutable god is amen so let's go to the book of Psalms. And, and so, most of the Psalms were written by David, that second king of Israel. And he was this poet, and he just loved to write about God and pour out his heart to God. And so if we go to the book of Psalms in chapter 33, verse 10 and 11, it says, 
The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the, he, he makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. In verse 11, it says, The counsel of the Lord stands forever, and the plans of his heart to all generations. So, so we have the contrast here. We have the plans of man and the plans of all the nations. He says, The Lord brings the plans of, uh, of all the nations to nothing, <laughs> and the plans, the, people, the plans of all the people to no effect. But when God's plans come, the counsel of the Lord stands forever, and the plans of his heart to all generations. So, so I, know, I don't think I put it in the notes, but in Proverbs 19, verse 22, it says, Many are the plans of the man's heart, but it's the Lord who, is, who, who makes, his, makes his path. And so, so we need to understand, it's, it's this unchangeable, immutable God who is the one who has the ability to direct our steps, and, and, and it is in him we should trust. And we, we should not put our trust in the nations or in the world leaders, you know, the next president that's coming next November. Big deal. We need to trust in God. You know, how many, how many politicians have we, have we voted for, have we, have we trusted in, have we, have we hoped would make a good change for this country, and yet they keep dragging this country to the ground? We need to not trust in a, in a, in a po politician or even a world leader. We need to trust in the one who created the whole world. Amen? Amen. So let's keep going in the book of Psalms, though. Uh, chapter 103, verse 17. Psalm chapter 103, verse 17 says, But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And, and so it says a lot in that one little verse. It says the mercy of God continues from everlasting to everlasting. He, it, it does not change. It always, it, it's one of those attributes of God that is unchangeable, immutable. And, and, and it says, it says, on those who fear him. So that's a, that gives something for us to take a hold of. We need to understand, there is, we don't need to fear anything on this earth, but we, need, we do need to have a healthy fear of God and respect him and walk in that fear of God. And, and it says that if we do that, the mercy of the Lord is upon us. That's unchanging, amen? amen. Okay, let's go to Psalm 119. It's one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible, and it's the longest chapter in the whole Bible. You can actually fit like 30 different books of the Bible into, into this chapter 119 of the Psalms. And so in, in Psalm chapter 119, verses 89 and 90, let's see, 89 and 90, it says, this is a psalm written by David again, and he's just pouring out his heart. And I, I love the way that he wrote Psalm 119. It's, it's, it's 22 stanzas, and it's just, it's just pouring out his heart. He's just loving God. He, loves, he keeps expressing how he loves the, 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 the precepts of the Lord and how he just desires to know God with everything that he is. So in Psalm 119, verses 89 and 90, it says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You establish the earth, and, and it abides. And so he's, he's just crying out for, uh, to, to God, and he's acknowledging that, that God is forever. And it says that, that his word is settled in heaven. That we just, the song we just sung, sung, sang about, it says, it says, your word gives us life that's never ending. It, it's, it, it's eternal. Amen? And so... Uh, in verse 160 of the same chapter, uh, in, in Psalm 119, Psalm 119, verse 160, it says, The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures for how long? Ever. Forever. <laughs> it just keeps going. So we, need, so we need to embrace that. We need to look, look at God and, and his word. It says the heavens and earth will pass away, but God's word will, will continue forever. Amen? So then let's jump into one of the major prophets, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40 is a beautiful chapter, and, and, and it's kind of poetic in its nature as well. But we're going to cover two parts of Isaiah chapter 40. So Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, and, and this was in that song that we just sang as well. It says, the grass, <laughs> the grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands 
forever. So, that, so that's another attribute of God that's immutable. There's nothing changing. Once, once God put it, puts it down on paper, it stands forever. Now, I, I believe or we believe at Rampart Christian Fellowship that, that God's word is inerrant and infallible, and, it, and, and, it's, and it's that way in the original language. In, it was originally written in ancient Hebrew and Greek and a little bit of Aramaic. And, and, those three, and those were divinely inspired by God. And in those original languages, it is, it is without flaw. There is, though, when, when it's translated into, into other languages, there is the, the ability for, for certain things to be lost in translation. So if you become a student of the Bible, it's, it's always healthy to, to, when you read something and you're studying a part of the Bible, to look it up, not only in the English or in the various different English translations, and, and cross-reference it, but also look it up on, in what's called a lexicon, and it looks up the actual original Greek. There's a great resource online called Blue Letter Bible, and if you wanted to see, okay, what does it mean that the grass withers? And, and you could look it up in the original language, and you could click on the word, and it'll tell you what the meaning of that word, the different meanings of that word in the original language. Because so uh, sometimes you'll just read something and it'll sound kind of weird. And it's like, is that really right? Is that what it means to say? And it, it, it's a good, healthy thing for you to study God's word and to get in every meaning of it. And, and, to, and to really, it, it's, it, you know, there's a, an expression, it's called chewing on God's word. So you read something and then you think about it, you study it, you look it up in these different translations, and you really get it into your heart. Because it, the, the, the Bible is clear, is that God's word is everlasting. It's immutable. And so it's, it's worth studying. You know, the, I, I heard a story about people who, who, this one pastor who was studying law. He was going to become a lawyer. And while he was in law school, you know, he was taking, he was taking all these exams. And while he was studying for the exam, you know, uh, throughout the semester, some of the laws actually changed. <laughs> during the time that he was in school. And so, so it was, he was getting so frustrated that he was doing all this work and memorizing all these different cases and doing all this studying of man's law, and it would, it would change before he even got a chance to, to impute it into or apply it onto his test. And so, but then when he started studying the Bible, it was a great relief to him that God's word never changes. And so he could study something in God's law, and he knows that that's going to be there for forever, for the rest of his life, for the rest of all eternity. And so it was, it was a great relief to him to study the word of God because it wasn't something that's always changing and always, always going with the winds of, the, of this world. Amen? And so in the, in the same chapter in the book of Isaiah, we have a beautiful piece of scripture that a lot of people, I'm sure, have heard. And it starts in verse 28 of Isaiah chapter 40. It says, Have you not known... Have you not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, never faints nor is weary? He, he, his understanding is unsearchable. In verse 29, he gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall, shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, shall mount up on wings like eagles, and, the, and shall run and not be weary, and shall walk and not faint. So if you're trusting in the Lord, you're trusting in the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. And it says that he never faints nor gets weary. God isn't, isn't getting all tired. He isn't, he isn't up there trying to get the earth to go the way that he wants it to go. He knows exactly what's going on. He knows exactly the way this world is going to end. He knows exactly how your life is going to end and the day that your life is going to end. And he, and he is working all these things together. God, and God, it says right there that God will give power to the weak and those who have no might, he, he will increase their strength. It says, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength and shall mount up on wings like eagles and shall run and not be weary. And so what do we need to do? We need to not trust in ourselves. We need to not trust in this world. We need to trust in the, uh, the unchanging, immutable, everlasting God. Amen? So I pray that, 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 you, that, you, that you read that verse and keep reading that verse and understand those who wait on the Lord, those are the ones who are going to see his power come to pass. Amen? Okay, let's jump into the New Testament now, into the book of Hebrews. That's closer to the end of your Bible. You know, Hebrews and James, near the book of Revelation there. Hebrews chapter 
13, verse 8. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is what? Is the same. <laughs> he's the same yesterday, he's the same today, and he's the same forever. And that's crazy. Because some people, some other religions, think that Jesus Christ is a created being. Like he's, he's Michael the archangel. Some, some people believe in, in Jehovah's Witnesses. Or some people think that he's one of the spirit children of Elohim, which the Mormons believe. And so he came into being. But according to that verse, it says Jesus Christ is, this, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's eternal. He's unchanging. That's, that's one of the verses right there that, that, that pictures Jesus Christ as being God. Because Jesus Christ is God. He's, one, he's the second person in the Trinity. And so, so we need to understand that, that, that Jesus Christ hasn't, didn't, never came into being. He, he, he has always existed. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have always existed, and they are immutable. They, they never change. Amen? And so, so remember that verse, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. It says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And don't, get, don't let anybody deceive you into, into believing that Jesus Christ is a created being, because they will lead you into heresy. Amen? So, and then the next book over, in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 17, it says, Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above, and comes down from the Father of lights. With him there is no variation, nor shadow of turning. It says that God, with God, there is no variation. There's no shadow of turning. There's no, there, the, God does not... This way one day and this way another day. A lot of people like to think that the God of the Old Testament is the God of wrath and the God of the New Testament is the God of grace or love. But, but that's not true. The, the same God in the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. And all of his attributes are eternal. He, he, he also loved a lot of people in the Old Testament. And he, he, pour, he poured out grace on many people in the Old Testament. And, and, and if you ever read the book of Revelation, he pours out his wrath on the entire planet. <laughs> and so, so God is a God of justice. And, and, and from eternity past to eternity present, God does not tolerate evil. God never tolerates evil. And, and so... A lot is, there are a few verses in the Old Testament where people will seem, it looks like God changed his mind. Or, or it looks like God was, was kind of reacting in a way that, that's different than his nature. Because in, in, in um, Genesis chapter 6, it says when God saw that how evil the world was before the flood, before Noah, before Noah got on the boat, he said that there was so much evil on the world that God actually regretted making man. It says that he, that he repented from, from, from making man. But, but, it was, but it was speaking about his, his, his emotional nature. It wasn't speaking that he, that he changed his mind because he, he, knew, he knew exactly how wicked man was going to be. But there's, see, there's, there's aspects of God that is, that's so hard for the human mind to understand that he can both be eternal and outside of time, but he can also be here in the present. And he can actually be here with us. And so when God is here, while God is here with us and outside of time, he, he grieves, he feels emotion. And so when the, when the people were doing all the evil things, even though he knew it was already going to happen, it still grieved the heart of God. But it didn't change who he was. He never enjoyed evil. He, he has never accepted darkness. And so it also in the book of Jonah, it says Jonah was sent to go bring a message of, God, of God's wrath to the Ninevites. And Jonah didn't want to go send a, send a message of God's wrath to the Ninevites. He's like, no, I'm not going to do it because I know you're forgiving God. <laughs> and so, but, but he got swallowed by a whale, got spit out on the beach, went to Nineveh, and he said, turn or burn. <laughs> if you guys don't stop what you're doing, God will judge you. And so, but the Ninevites, they changed. And they, and they stopped what they were doing. And since they changed, God relented from bringing this punishment. But God never changed. He never tolerated their evil. But, but he, 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 he gives grace. He also gives the opportunity to obey. And so his, his righteousness and his judgment and his mercy are always the same. He never changes. But he, we are in time and we are given the ability to change. So, so if anybody wants to bring up these Old Testament verses, they, they don't speak of God changing. It's the human beings that change. It's the human beings that incur God's wrath. And it's, 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 it's us that are in 
this time-space continuum. That's, that's, we are the ones who are subject to change. And, and, and since we can choose to do what is right, we can actually um, reap, the conse or reap the benefits of, of God's blessing. Now, I mean, uh, what is, who was it? Joshua said, choose this day whom you're going to serve. <laughs> he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He said, he said choose, you know, choose, every day, blessing and cursing is set before you. God doesn't change. He can either give you blessing every day or cursing every day. You can change, though. You can make a choice to decide to serve God and honor God or reject God and, and, and get his wrath on your life. It's up to you. Amen? <clears throat> so that was James. Uh, let's go to the book of Revelation real quick <clears throat> in chapter 4, verse 8. And we've, we've talked about this the past couple weeks. This is, a, this is a picture that, that uh, the Apostle John gets in, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. It says that the Apostle John was lifted up into the, into the heaven and he saw the throne of God and he saw all this, you know, uh, these beings worshiping God. And in verse 8, it says, The four living creatures having six wings were full of eyes all around and within. And they did not rest day or night, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. In other words, he is immutable. He is, he is everlasting. He, he does not change. And so the angels in heaven are, are crying out day and night, and they're screaming, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And so, so we need to understand that if heaven is crying out that God is everlasting, and, the, and the, the, it says the whole heavens are, are, are crying out to God, we need, to, we need to line up with that, and we need to believe that God does not change. His promises are true. Amen? So the last part, I always like to ask the question, so how does this, this attribute of God apply to my life? What, what does it mean? What does it mean for me? Well, I believe that the immutability of God should be the solid foundation in every, every believer's life. The fact that God does not change should be the true, no, true north on our compass. Yeah, the, 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 remember these truths and let them guide your life. So the first truth that I, that I highlighted is that God always keeps his promises. Let's go to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. So, so I believe that this truth, that God is immutable, he is never changing, this should be just like a compass. You know the compass always points north. And the same way, God never changes, is, it should be something that, that we should always come back to. We, it, it's always the same direction. And so in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says, And we know, it's not that we guess, not that we hope, what we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to, the, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And I'll, I'll even keep going. In Romans chapter 8, verse 29, it says, For those he foreknew, that means he already knew them from before the foundations of the world, he also predestined, and to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might get, uh, be the firstborn of many brethren. Moreover, moreover, in verse 30, it says, Whom he predestined, he also called. And whom he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. So, so that's a promise of God. That, that if you love God, and you are near the called, and, and God has already known you, and he's conforming you into the image of his son, that you, that you might be the firstborn of many brethren. He says, moreover, he, he predestined you. He called you. He's also justifying you. He, he also justified, and then eventually we, uh, you will be glorified as, uh, when we stand before him in heaven. We need to understand that, that, that God is true to his promises. He's going to work everything together for good. Yeah, and, and some people, it's hard to think. You're like, how is God going to work this together for good? We don't know. We don't know how he's going to work all these together, things together for good, but that's a promise that God has, and, I, and, I, and it's, it's better than any promise that you have on this earth. Amen? And then uh, let's talk about sin. You know, we talk, we, we talk about sin a lot in the church. You know, the, the, there's all these sins. You know, the homosexuality is a sin. All, you know, you know, all these different things are sins, and we should, we should stay away from them. So, so let's look at what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except such that is common to man. But, check this out, God is faithful who will not, not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with every temptation will make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So 
there's sin in this world. There's temptations to sin in this world. And no temptation to sin is, is new. Like, oh, you don't know what I, have to do, uh, what I have to deal with. No. God is faithful, though. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you, what you can bear. And, and, and some people might question that. No, nah, I don't know. I mean, it's, you think of a certain temptation. You're like, I can't not do it. But it says, with every temptation, God will make a way. God will always make a way of escape. It's, but it is upon your choice to choose that way. And, uh, and so, so God is faithful to, uh, in, in our situation that, that, that we're faced with temptations to sin. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except such that is common to man. Everybody is tempted to sin. Everybody has been tempted to lie. Everybody has te been tempted to lust. Everybody has been tempted to sin. But God is faithful. He will make a way. And so you might be wondering, well, what's that way? So, so I didn't put it in the notes. Let's go ahead and turn there. In Galatians chapter 5, that, that, this, is, this is the way. In, in, in uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, this is the way that God has made for every time there's a temptation. Galatians 5, 16, it says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So you're tempted. You got something facing you, and you're like, I don't know if I can resist this temptation. Well, this is, what, the way, this is the way that God has made for us to avoid this temptation. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The word walk is a verb. It's an action word. It's, it's, it, it speaks of what you do. So, for example, if you're tempted to go to a strip club, well, if you, if you, if you can, you, God has made a way for you to resist that temptation. He says, walk in the Spirit. So if you're sitting at church, you're not sitting at a strip club. And so the, this, the physical action of you coming to church is giving you a way of escape from the temptation of, of being at a strip club. And if you're reading a Bible, you're not looking at a, a, a Playboy or something like that. You know, if, you're, if you're doing the things of God, you're not doing the things of the flesh. And so walking in the Spirit is doing the things that honor God instead of doing the things that fulfill your lust and, and your desires of your flesh. Amen? And so God has always made a way of escape from sin. And so, and God will always make a way. And, and, and if, you're, if you're coming to a point where you're like, I don't know, I can't see the way, cry out to God. Uh, he is there. He's, it says uh, in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. All you got to do, Jesus said, I am the way, <laughs> I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if you don't know how to get away from whatever sin or temptation is in, uh, facing you, cry out to Jesus. He will, he will meet you where you're at. Amen? And then the last thing is God never fails. God, God isn't trying to, to overpower Satan. God isn't trying to win this war of good and evil. God has already won the war of good and evil. When Jesus Christ was on the cross, he said, it is finished. That means that the, the, the payment for sin has been paid. It is done. It is over. So when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you, you, already, you already have victory. You have the victory that was paid on the cross 2,000 years ago. And so God never fails. He knows what's going on. He, and he wrote the end of the story. Re, read the book of Revelation. He knows how it's going to go down. He isn't wondering, oh, I don't, I hope... You know, this happened. God isn't up there hoping. He knows how it's going down. So, so God isn't, is, isn't working to victory. He is already working from victory. God never fails. And so uh, what I like to do when I think about how God never fails, I like to worship him. And, and in the book of Psalms, there's a beautiful psalm, Psalm 136. And the whole psalm is just this continual refrain of how we can praise God because he doesn't fail. Because he's everlasting. And what does it say? In Psalm 136, it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks, thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, because his mercy endures forever. To him who alone, who does great wonders, his mercy endures forever forever and it continues to go on and on how his mercy endures forever how we can trust him day by day night by night every, every no matter what is going on god's mercy endures forever he's immutable he does not change and so we can draw close to that we can be encouraged by that we can have this true north compass no matter what's going on i know god doesn't change 
People may go, people may turn against me. People may start hating me. You know what? I don't care. I know who God is. I know he doesn't change. And I can hold on to that. That's something I, that's something that encourages me every day. You know, I, I look at my bills sometimes like, wow, that's, that doesn't encourage me, but I know God doesn't change. I know he is faithful. <laughs> I, I know he is able to make a way. So, so I, I just, I, I praise him for his glory. I praise him that his mercy endures forever. And the final thing I want to leave you with is my life verse. This is what I try and live out with my entire life. It's uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Not, not most of your heart, not, not just the heart that, that you have on Sunday morning or Wednesday night. He says, with all your heart. And it says, lean not on your own understanding. Man, we try and be so smart and figure everything out. God says, no, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, that's all your ways, Acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. He will show you the way to go. And so, so why can we trust God? Because he's immutable. <laughs> because he does not change. We can trust him with all of our heart. And we, can, we, we don't need to figure it all out. God has already figured it out. And he doesn't change. Amen? So let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your grace, your mercy, your power, your unchanging, immutable nature, Lord. I thank you that you've given us this solid rock to stand on, this, this, this true north compass that we can always look to that never changes, Lord. I pray that, we, that it would encourage our hearts that we might be able to stand in these evil days. As this world is falling apart, we know that you are bringing all things together for good. For, your, for, for those who love you, Lord. And I pray that we would share your light and share your love with this dying world, that they may see your true nature and glorify you and be drawn to you. Your son, uh, Jesus said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men to me. So I pray that we, each individual that hears this message, would lift Christ high, that they, that they might be drawn to you. So I thank you for, the, for this day, Lord. I thank you for your word. And we just offer it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I have a special song that I found on the internet about God doesn't change. And it's an old gospel song. Can I introduce somebody to y'all? We're at the FC Ball. <laughs>